In today's video, we will see how we can enhance the context of an image further by showing exactly where this image can be found in the sky. To do this, we'll be using a relatively new process called Finding Chart. This process will take a plate-solved image and create a star chart that shows where in the sky the area covered by this image can be found. Please note that your image must have an astrometric solution. Your image may already have this information if it was created using a recent version of WBPP. Otherwise, you may need to do something to add this information to the image. And the best way to do this is using the Image Solver script. I covered how to use the Image Solver script to create an astrometric solution in my Annotate Image video, and I'll leave a link to that below so you can look at that again if you need to. All finder charts created by the finding chart process are square with a default size of 1024 pixels. This size can be changed here to almost anything you might want. For our purposes, we're going to change this to 2048. The next thing we can look at is chart resolution. The chart resolution control maps out the resolution of the chart in terms of arc seconds per pixel. The default is 120, and I typically leave it at that setting for the first try in creating a chart, then come back and adjust it to my liking. So we're going to leave this on automatic chart resolution to begin with. The next control is limiting magnitude. This basically talks about what stars will be shown on our chart. The default setting is 7, and we'll leave it at that using the automatic mode for the first chart we make, and then we'll come back and adjust that a little bit later. The next option changes the behavior of the tool. Rather than creating a new image in the PixInsight environment, you can create a PGN bitmap file that can be saved to a file in a specific folder. The main reason for doing this, I think, is with a PGN file, you can make an overlay. I don't typically use it this way, so I have never used this particular feature. The next section talks about what kind of information we're going to include on the chart. We can have the coordinate grids, constellation borders, the constellation lines, the names of the constellation, stars and star names, Messier objects, and NGC IC objects. As a default, all of these are selected for, except for the NGC IC objects, and we'll see why that is a bit later. And finally, we have a color section where each of the different labels has a default color, and you can override these colors and choose what you'd prefer to have on your chart. As I said, we're going to basically be using the default and creating the first chart to see how it looks. To test out the finding chart process, I'm going to be using my wide field image of a region in Sagittarius, which includes the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid Nebula, uh, Messier 21, which is an open cluster, as well as some other interesting nebulae which can be found in the region. So we're going to drag our triangle just onto the image. With our finding chart, we basically see a pretty large chunk of sky. We can see the grid system, we can see the various constellations, and in the center we can see a little pattern of red. Let's zoom in on that a bit. This square red rectangle is precisely where our image is located in the sky. The size is correct, the angle is correct, and this one red dot constitutes the absolute coordinates for one corner of the image. And now that we have this, we can actually go back and create another one and see what various options would do to change it. I'm going to move this over here, and the first option I want to explore is the NGC IC objects. This was not turned on by default. Let's see why that might be. We're going to select it now, and we're going to drag the triangle back onto the image. All right, so now we have our original finding chart and the one we just created. We'll put it right next to it so we can compare. And here I think you can see the problem. There are so many objects that they clutter the field and they make it less clear. Um, and as you zoom in, you can see that it's still very cluttered. So this is an option I would recommend that you turn off unless you're dealing with a very narrow piece of sky where the clutter will be less of a problem. But in general, I tend to leave this off and that's pretty much why. All right, we're gonna get rid of this one for now. Now let's go back and try some other options in here. Let's look at the chart resolution. We're going to turn off the automatic one, and we're going to explore what happens when we take this number, and we're going to double it, and we're going to have it. So let's go back to, let's go up to 240. 
and let's try running it on the image again and see what we get. All right, pull up the old one, pull over the new one. What we can see is by going to 240, we doubled the resolution. We're covering a much bigger chunk of sky. And by comparison, the region we covered is even smaller. There may be times you want to do that, where you want to give, give a big picture context to where your image was. But for my purposes, this is probably too wide a field. So let's see what happens if we were to go in here and let's go to 60. So we're going to bring this down to about, about half of where we were before. And now we're going to run it on this image once again. All right. Let's see what we've come up with. I'll rearrange this a little bit. All right. So here's where we started. Now we went to a wider field. Now we're zoomed in. And depending on what you're trying to achieve, this may be what you want. Because now you can see the constellations around it, and you have a much better view of the area of the sky that you captured. So this may be what you're looking for. All depends on what you're trying to accomplish with your particular image. So let's go back to the default. Bring it back up to around 120. Now let's take a look at the star magnitude. What would happen if we turn this off and we went to a limiting magnitude of 7? Let's say we dropped it down to, I don't know, let's say 9. Go 9, and let's try that out. And I think for right now, I'm going to get rid of this version of the image. And this one. And we'll run it again. All right. Bring this up. Bring this right next to it. And you can see now we have a lot more stars in there. Um, sometimes this is a good thing is it makes it a little bit richer. Sometimes it's a bad thing in that when you have too many stars, it may clutter the field a bit and make it a little bit less clear what you're trying to share in terms of locational context. But that's kind of a decision you can make. Now, if you wanted to go to an extreme, you could pick this up to say 15. Now you'd expect you'd have a lot more stars. I wonder what that looks like. Well, that took a very long time to run, so I cut that out of the video. But let's take a look and see what we came up with by doing that. Here's the two we've done, and here's the one we've just done. Now we have so many stars, you almost can't see anything else in the sky. So that's probably not very useful. So let's get this out of the way and let's talk about what I, I'm going to do for this particular image where I'd like to go. I think I'm going to change the scale here from 120. Um, I think I'm going to bring it down to say about 95. I think the stars will stay away from 15 as a limiting magnitude. Um, but I think I'm going to take it up to maybe about 8. I'm not going to do a bitmap. I'm going to leave the NGC off. And I don't mind this default color scheme, so I think I'm pretty happy with that. Let's run our final image. Make sure we're happy with it. Okay, we're done. And this is where I came out. Bring this to the front. All right, I'm actually pretty happy with this. Uh, I like the scale. I like the level of stars that we have in here, and I like the field of view. I can see all the surrounding constellations. I think this is the one I'm going to go with. Now, at this point, you could say I'm done. I can take this image. I can save it as a JPEG. I can save it as a TIFF file, whatever you want to do. And it's useful for the other purposes that you might want to have for it. For me, I started doing this when I created my web page. And I like the idea when telling the story of my image that I could show not only the image, the annotated image, but also a nice finding chart so people had a pretty good idea um, where it was located in the sky. So this has been a really helpful tool for me and I use it when I'm communicating with others. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you, just like with some of the other tools, once you've kind of dialed this into the look you like, you might remember and dial it in again, but why not just drag a triangle onto the desktop, creating a process, which you can now name as my finding chart. And with this, I now have all the parameters that I've set up by trial and error. I can save this icon as part of my project and tie it to this particular image that I'm working with, or I could save it as a set of my iconified processes so that I have um, the parameter set the way I'd like them to when I'm working with other projects. This is a nice little tool and it creates a nice little chart that can be very useful when you're sharing uh, your image with others.